See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. Around the globe, Nurses have a long-standing tradition of being active and visible in our communities and innovating to improve health, safety, and well-being of people, the planet, and entire communities. They've done so in a variety of settings and roles, some that seem logical, obvious, and predictable, and others you might not have considered. I preside over the Senate. I also chair the Board of Pardons, where people come for second chances. Each lieutenant governor has a very set role, and I have been able to carve out this incredible work that has linked my nursing, my education, my experience as a previous legislator, and as a mom, and as a nurse, but I love it. It's the best job. The link between nursing, politics, and innovation might not seem obvious, but for the health professionals who have campaigned, served, and ushered in meaningful legislation, the relationship is a natural one. In this wide-ranging conversation with Delaware's Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long, we discover how clinical training and nursing innovation skills are uniquely valuable to writing, sponsoring, and passing legislation to keep our states, our citizens, our environment, and our economies healthy. Stay with us. Hi, this is Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hallbong. I'm proud and privileged to be a nurse. I am a faculty of nursing at the University of Delaware, a professor. I also teach in a program of urban affairs and women's studies. I am really delighted to have some time to speak with you today, not only in my capacity as a lieutenant governor and a former state representative and state senator here in the first state, the diamond state of Delaware, but also uh, frontline uh, as a nurse, as well as a mother, and how we come together in these roles to really make innovative policy change, particularly in the healthcare lane. Tell us about Delawareans and, and Delaware. Delaware being the first state has a lot of history and we are tucked nicely right in the middle of the mid-Atlantic and if you've traveled to Delaware before you can be in New York City within three hours you can be in our nation's capital in two and a half uh, the Inner Harbor and Fort McHenry uh, within an hour it is an awesome place and we represent the nation's demography as a neuroscientist I love doing research here because we really reflect the nation's population, both from gender and race, as well as socioeconomic status. It's a wonderful small community. We, former Governor Jack Markell said, you know, mm -hmm. we are a state of neighbors. People see me in the grocery store. They see me in the gym. <laughs> they know us to an elected office, and we know them. And we are a healthy state. We are not a perfect healthy state. We often end up on the lower scale with the infant mortality rate. We uh, often have higher levels of diabetes and chronic health conditions, particularly in our lower, more rural community, our mm -hmm. lower county. And again, we're small. We have three counties. But uh, we, we have our challenges in health. When we introduce ourselves, it is such an important ritual, a care ritual. When mm -hmm. we're coming in to take care of someone who is hurting, scared, has questions, they're facing a, a, a health situation. Our introduction is a therapeutic. And mm -hmm. I would love to hear your therapeutic yeah. introduction as to how you're responding to the, the citizens that you've been elected to serve. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a couple different responses. You know, one is to the direct person on the street, and another is if I'm in a meeting, right, of peers. And when I'm out on the street, which I do go out frequently, almost every week or every other week, I am what we call boots on the ground. And I go to a lot of places where people are uncomfortable. I am out on the street with mentally ill homeless. I go out and work quite vigorously with the most vulnerable among us. And I certainly do not, when I'm on the street, do not introduce myself as a lieutenant governor at first. What I'll do is I'll go up and say, hi, how are you? I'm a nurse. 
We've been out today handing out information and literature. We're trying to help persons. We've got some great free resources. So I start in that whole health conversation. By the time I'm finished, we weave into, you know, I recognize that you probably have just shared you don't have insurance. Let's get you signed up for insurance. Here's some bridge clinic. And by the way, here's my office card. If you need help getting the housing, your children have challenges, here's my information, and I am your lieutenant governor. And usually they're a little floored. They're a little like, <laughs> oh my gosh. They call me sometimes the undercover lieutenant governor, particularly now with COVID, because I will literally be covered head to toe. You are behind the mask. And yeah, I am behind that mask. And uh, when they find that out, they're like, get out. Are you serious? Why are you know? So it, it is kind of shocking. Well, to that point, getting nurses involved, you're, I'm not going to call it a journey. Let's call it a hike. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that combination of nursing, education, and legislation. Let's walk through the hike. Maybe there's been some slogging through the mud. What's that uh, story? Yeah, I mean, the, the story, you know, I got involved in policy when I was in graduate school and getting my master's in Charleston, South Carolina. My husband was military Navy. And I had several different persons who encouraged me. I was a first-generation college graduate, raised on a farm. And uh, my journey took me with my husband, and I got involved in a community of color um, where I was working with low income. And I began to really see that homeless, mentally ill veterans did not have a voice. And thanks to groups like the League of Women Voters and other nurse associations who were supportive and mentors, began to see I needed to be at the table. And so when I went to doctoral program, I did not go in with the intent to ever be running for office. And quite frankly, when I was in my master's program, um, you know, I'm an avid jogger and stuff. I remember I jogged that day. I was five minutes late and I got assigned this topic called nurses and politics. I'll never forget it. And I was like, oh my gosh, nurses and politics. Fast forward 30 years later, the class book that was assigned to us, I'm now featured in that book. Little did I know that that would happen, but I encourage folks to have an open mind. You need to put yourself out. You need to get uncomfortable and try some different things. So I tried also regulatory policy in my doctoral program. I had a chance to be, work with the United States Secretary of Health on the Secretary's Commission looking at nursing workforce. Had a chance to work bipartisan. I worked with names, I'm going to date myself now, U.S. Senator Dole and uh, U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy. Still did the clinical bedside nursing, you know, in the hospital and others while I was working my way through. But even more during my um, PhD program, saw where we had to have nurses. We have a role. Nurses understand business. We understand agriculture. We understand transportation. We understand education. So I went through the process. I ran on my first time and I lost <laughs> in the year 2000. And that's, Im by, that's important to know. Yeah, I lost. Yeah. I lost. So you pick yourself back up. That's what's more important. It's how you rebound. Well, the, the other part too is how you lost is I think a really important oh, it's part so of the story. Today. Yes, yeah. absentee ballots. I won at the polls, but I lost when they counted absentee yeah. ballots. So moral of the story, your absentee ballots matter, as <laughs> do your states today who are allowing voting by mail. So get those forms in early. For this year, it's particularly important during COVID. So you're right, I lost, but I pulled my pants back up the next day, put my big girl pants on, and I went right back out um, the very next day after I lost, and I went to a town meeting, and did come back and run again in one, and did six years in the House, and then nine years in the Senate, but I've had my ups and downs. What is a lieutenant governor, and why is it the best job in government? Lieutenant governors are second in line behind the, the governor, and a lot of times people don't understand. It's kind of like the vice president with the president at the United States level. We literally have great connections. You know, the governor, he or she is at this level and doing a lot with agencies and policies. We too, depending upon our assigned role constitutionally in Delaware, I preside over the Senate. I also chair the Board of Pardons where people come for second chances or coming for commutations who are incarcerated looking to have their sentence commuted. And many of us across the country have other entities. Kentucky's lieutenant governor, she oversees education. Nevada's, she does transportation, infrastructure, finance, and tourism. Louisiana does tourism. Each lieutenant governor has a very set role. People don't always know exactly what we do, but we have freedom. And I have been able to carve out this incredible work that has linked my nursing, my education, 
my experience as a previous legislator and as a mom and as a nurse. So I'm doing mental health and substance use, which is really an epidemic in our country and in our state. We are making really important groundbreaking models and I get the privilege of chairing the Lieutenant Governor's Association. So I get really good ideas from other states and I share what I'm doing here. We are all up to doing the census right now. We are really struggling with COVID to get a complete count with our census, but I love it. It's the best job because you can create and do what you want. And I've kind of gotten the bully pop it to talk about healthy lifestyles. Um, I, I built on the Lieutenant Governor's Challenge, which is physical and mental health. You can probably hear in my voice, I get really excited because it has allowed me to grow from the Senate role and the House role, where over that period of time, I sponsored over a thousand pieces of legislation. 60% of those were on health care. But now I get to execute and I've shifted lanes. So I kind of shifted from the legislative lane to the executive and I love it. So that's why it's kind of the best job. It's a lot of flexibility and a lot of fun. And is your role of the chair of the National Lieutenant Governors Association, I would imagine that is like this innovation laboratory. It feels like that is an opportunity to test different ideas or to take one policy and say, how does this play out in a small state that's rural or a large state that's rural? How does that differ when you're in a place that has a very cold climate versus one that's a very temperate climate, one that's on a shore, one that's inland and landlocked, and you're comparing those things? You're right. The National Lieutenant Governor is is a great place to share models. We have a lot of things that we have in common across states, whether you're a small state, urban, or rural, right? Very easy to look at issues of incarceration and how we're doing prison and reentry and programs or education. Um, we were in Kansas City, Missouri, talking with the mayor who's made transportation free. Land use is a great example, too. Walkable, bikeable communities as we look at environmental health issues, as we look at community cleanups and environmental justice or social justice. From the standpoint, if you think about innovation and legislation, they have an interesting relationship with each other. How is it that nurses being in politics can really be an act of innovation? Um, You know, nursing in and of itself, being in public policy roles, whether it be at a local level, a county level, a state legislative level, or like myself, statewide office, lieutenant governor, or even at the congressional level, that in and of itself is innovation in healthcare. We have very few nurses who've been involved in the front lines of being an elected position. In these roles, we innovate. Uh, I've had over in my Senate, when my Senate and House career, over a thousand pieces of legislation I co-sponsored um, during that time, made big changes, created all payers data systems, advanced telehealth care, created an office of occupational health, did the Caregivers Act, supported decision making, innovation and healthcare and policy is so important. How do we get rid of uh, pollution? Are we going to have brownfields? Um, you know, down at University of Maryland School of Nursing, very engaged in community hazards and mitigation and environment. A good example of another fellow nurse who used to be a state rep with me, who I mentored, who came after me as a rep, Representative Rebecca Walker, in her role as Deputy Director, Chief Administrative Officer in the Department of Forensics, so in the Medical Examiner's Office, because as a forensics nurse, her policy work with mine in Delaware, working with key leaders, created with other legislators the overdose system of care. So Delaware is the first state in the country to implement the overdose system of care, preventing when you have a law enforcement agent or first responder show up at someone's home multiple times who've overdosed, we can try to get them immediately into care without it with a diversion. And so I'm very proud of that. I could go on with different examples for myself. And if you were to interview other nurses who are in policy roles, whether regulatory or elected office, they could also share with you how they've made a difference, not only in the profession, but everyday lives of children and families across this great country. Because nurses have served in a policymaking capacity, that is innovation in and of itself. In thinking about this discussion with you, the last two days, I did a survey of headlines around the globe, legislative headlines and innovation headlines. And I just want to just go through a couple of them with you. And quite literally in the headlines just in the last two days have included nursing homes, the reopening of schools, telehealth, harm reduction, AIDS, 
gun violence, housing and food deserts, food subsidies, environment, injury control, product safety and FDA therapies and testing, professional licensing, road safety, parks, recreation and land management, the post office, worker safety, access to care through multilingual services, hazardous materials, school lunch programs, domestic violence, prisons health, evictions and homelessness, black maternal health, mask mandates, public gatherings, and then I stopped. But as I was looking at those legislative and innovation headlines, because these were being reported in the tech journals, the innovation blogs, I looked through this and I thought, there is not a single one of those topics where nursing and nursing experience and expertise wouldn't be vital in helping to develop understanding, shaping, direction, confidence, and calm. Mm -hmm. But I'm just thinking you've got this portfolio career, nursing, nursing education, and then policy slash legislation. Thinking about all of these different topics, what are the benefits that you're bringing with all of those different disciplines residing in one mind, Mm -hmm. uh, one conscience, to really help us think about the topics and the challenges? You know, great, a great point. I will share with you all the topics that you just listed are things that I've been fortunate enough to touch on. And if you were to interview and talk to every nurse almost in any city, any town across this country, I guarantee you three quarters to almost 80% of persons you speak with, nurses have touched on those topics, whether it's caring for our most vulnerable during COVID in our nursing homes, to those who are unfortunately experiencing trauma, or those who've lived through AIDS. We as nurses, we're unique because we come at a different skill set. We are able to listen and problem solve and think out of the box. Nurses make a difference from day one when they graduate. We take it to a different level compared to other policymakers because we come already equipped with a really unique skill set of being able to take a little information by comments that people make, by our observations in a community. You know, when I drive through a community, I can tell you immediately about the socioeconomic status. I can tell you if they have behavioral health challenges based on who's on the street, who's parked in the hotel parking lots, who is homeless. I am routinely with our governor challenged trying to work through gun violence in our urban communities. And they're really coming at it from a policy lens, forgetting about the underlying health issues and the trauma and how they want to put all this money, which is important to have money in the justice and money in prevention. But nobody thinks about the doorstep and the family. And I will speak up and I will say, have you talked to the school nurse? Well, really, really, hmm, the school nurse? And then they come back and are like, oh my goodness, the school nurse really knew where the kids were couch surfing. The school nurse knows where children are having more trauma. But because school nurses are not engaged, for example, that we have great school nurses across this country, and they get forgotten. And that's why whether you are the listeners are in the community, maybe I'm talking today to some business leaders, maybe I'm talking to nonprofit community. Think about Have you had nurses at your table? A lot of times we put funds into structures and agencies that are state run. And all we needed to do was ask a nurse who is in that (laughs) community and they would lead you to the community leader, the grandmother on the corner who everybody respects, the faith-based leader. And you will cut through a lot of red tape and probably save a few hundred thousand dollars, maybe a few million dollars. And a lot of time. Yeah. And you will have an outcome. Because nurses are doers, we're problem solvers, and we're excellent listeners, and we know how to manage resources. I sponsored legislation that created the Office of Occupational Health in the state of Delaware. It took me three and a half years as a legislator. I had to stick to it. But as a nurse, I knew that that was going to have a long-term consequence and help save Delawareans in the long term whether it was cancer, radon, other health issues. Can you speak to your role as Lieutenant Governor during COVID? I mean, I've been listening to your recovery reports and speaking directly to the citizens of Delaware, and I think really bringing a voice of calm. I, you know, talk about your role during COVID and, and what has that yeah. meant 
the role of the lieutenant governor who happens to be a nurse? It's been a unique challenge because I like quick decisions. I like things done fast when policy doesn't always work that way. And I recognize the frustrations in our community, in our state, across our country. We go from being a very vibrant, active community where we're shut down and we're isolated. So we had the physical health that we had to worry about first, and now we're dealing with inequities. And then we're also dealing with mental health and depression and overdose death rates in Delaware have increased like the nation here. We've increased 47% since COVID. So it's a hotbed of a lot of challenge, but I see it as a new opportunity. We have positive changes, more telehealth, We've seen where things have worked in our communities. We've brought together for the first time nursing homes and hospital systems and communities and first responders. So I, as a nurse, have had the chance to co-chair with our Secretary of State, the Pandemic Resurgence Committee. I have continued to work in our most high-risk communities, working with the mentally ill, the substance users, our persons with chronic pervasively mentally ill. I myself have personally screened well over 1,000 to 2,000 individuals, you know, fully in PPE as kind of that undercover lieutenant governor. But our biggest thing has been accomplished. We've gotten people protected. We've kept our infectivity rate down. I'm very proud of the states in the Mid-Atlantic region. We shut down early. We protected persons. We got our PPE. And that's what our plan is going forward, looking at the health bucket, the business bucket, and equity. And in order to have a healthy business, you have to first have a healthy community. And you have to address those inequities in communities of color and making sure that people have the housing, have the transportation, have the resources to protect themselves. There's this interesting relationship between legislation or legislators and innovators. And there are some very specific topics that you have been vocal about that have been revealed, I think, by COVID. And one of them is our digital divide. Explain what those things are that you're seeing and how the the technology and the innovation really have impacted communities and where you're working as far as your advocacy on how we're closing the digital divide. Yeah, and it's important. Yeah, COVID has sh- it shed a light on what we already knew. It's just kind of reinforced what our hunches had been and anecdotally, particularly in communities of color or communities with lower socioeconomic status where they do have lack of broadband. I know nationally and as well as in our state, we're making great investments to make sure that now that children can't be in school, you know, many states started opening schools and they closed. Our state has allowed each of the districts to determine whether they open in a hybrid online fashion or rotating every other day live and putting other protections in place. But it's not, you know, for children who, when the schools just dramatically shut quickly, even if you have the device, it doesn't do you any good if you don't have the internet to connect to. During this COVID outbreak, I went out and I saw the lack of resources, particularly for our most vulnerable communities. A lot of children whose parents lost homes that were evicted ended up in hotels. They didn't have devices, they had an iPhone. So how are they doing their schoolwork? So school was a component. As a health provider, we've all witnessed and experienced, particularly during COVID, telehealth. I had sponsored the first legislation probably eight or more years ago. And we've been saying, what if we didn't have telehealth? During this experience, it has been really important for physical health, but it's also been important for emotional well-being. So between telehealth and broadband, so my role has been to advocate to support, you know, we have a fabulous director of technology in our state. Our governor has been very committed, but we have to make sure, and that's where equity matters. Again, it's those who have the resources or not, and it's not equality, it is equity, really different. And that's where nurses get it. Nurses know the clear distinction between equality and equity, and people talk a talk, but nurses, they walk the walk. And that's why, you know, every, business and board and nonprofit entity should have a nurse involved on their board or should engage in them because we will relate and we connect and in innovation we are a uh, <laughs> we are a repertoire of innovative ideas it's just we don't always get asked we're not always part of the table and I would encourage people to get more nurses involved As a lieutenant governor, I have had 
um, the privilege of tearing the board apart. And a lot of people think, oh, that must be horrible. It's not. Oh, it's One of the beautiful. best things I do. Yeah. It's an exciting time. You know, yeah. and we certainly, you know, are very careful about our recommendations. Our governor ultimately makes the decision. We certainly have individuals who come for us for commutations or who come for us who are not ready. Um, you know, it's not their time yet. They need to do more time. They need to change, have more remorse. So not everybody who comes gets a pardon or gets a commutation, but we have a great system in the state of Delaware. It's actually been nationally highlighted. The staff are phenomenal. You know, we have a board that reviews this and, it, and we work efficiently and effectively. And so again, we've been in the Washington Post, we've been in the covered because we try to be as equitable as we possibly can. Well, you really persons. have been um, a leader in the social justice innovation. We don't necessarily tie those two things together. We think of social justice as this activity that's driven by policy. We don't necessarily think of innovating in the space of um, in our prison systems or in our correctional services or in behavioral change. And there's such a tie between our behavioral health, mental health conditions, and our prisons, and not a particularly healthy one. Mm -hmm. What are some of the innovations that you guys are driving? And, I, and again, that intersection of legislation, innovation, social justice. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And Pew Charitable Trust, we created our behavioral health consortium three years ago, where we've been working statewide. We had 1,100 recommendations, whittled it down to three years of 110 guiding recommendations, cradle to grave, autism to Alzheimer's, which affects the correctional system which included law enforcement in prison, really very important because mental health is a big issue. Psychiatric care in America, the largest institution that provides psych care are our prisons and our jails. In Delaware, we have a unified system that is both a jail and prison. So our correction facility encompasses both in our state. And so we have the opportunity, we worked really hard with our Department of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, our Commissioner of Corrections, to really prevent those re-entry. It's costly. That is health ineffectiveness. That is health inefficiency. That is why gross domestic product in this country, 18% of our dollars are spent on health care. But then we look at other countries, whether it be France, or uh, Switzerland or Germany and others who put a lot less gross domestic product but have had better health outcomes. So we have to begin to look at that in the prison system and correctional system is a really important area where we could address early on and prevent persons from incarceration. I would say 90% of the persons who come before me in Delaware at the Board of Pardons started in their juvenile years because of trauma or some mental health condition that's undiagnosed, self-medicating, doing behaviors out of trauma, and they end up in a long life of career of crime that could have easily been prevented. And so I'm hoping that in America, as we're looking at shifts in our healthcare, as we're recognizing that mental health it is okay not to be okay. You don't have to struggle alone. Once we recognize mental health parity as so important, and we're hearing that with professional athletes now, they're all coming out and sharing their stories. Here, by the grace of God, many individuals aren't incarcerated, but many who are should not be incarcerated. They have a mental health condition that should have been prevented and treated long ago. You said that this interesting intersection of chairing so many different health and social services committees aimed at focusing on how you're going to create a healthier Delaware, mm -hmm. um, healthier citizens by focusing on the mental health systems, cancer inequities. Besides the hazards of in-person voting <laughs> during a pandemic, how are voting help and health innovation related? Voting and health innovation are really important and related. We can't take, well, there's several stories here. There's different layers to this onion, right? Voting is absolutely critical. Bad elected officials come from good citizens who choose not to vote. And we have to, particularly in healthcare and in nursing, with our oaths that we take and our social justice platforms and our social practice policies, we have to be involved the intersection of innovation and legislation and actually education at this point is the Yale Candidate School. Talk about, well, first of all, what is it? And I think you know the story pretty well of how that came into being. Share that. 
Yeah, I mean, the school itself, that program, and then I'll highlight a couple others that have been in place too that are a little more broad, um, but not specific to nursing. But no, from uh, young students, I call them young, uh, energetic students, <laughs> Sharon doesn't really like me for that, energetic students at Yale, you know, remotely in their doctoral program, recognize the value of nurses being at the table and have created this phenomenal candidacy school. Unfortunately, this year with COVID, we weren't able to meet live, but walking people through bipartisan, working through understanding how do you run for office? Should I run for office? And if I'm not running for office, there are roles for people. Not every nurse has to run for office, but get behind candidates, support exactly. them, write a yeah. check, door knock, or get involved in the regulatory policy side. Once a bill becomes law, doesn't mean it's going to be executed appropriately at the national level. Follow the federal registry, get engaged, understand administrative procedures. There are a few other centers across the country that have centers in health policy. Years ago, when I was a faculty at George Mason um, back in the 90s under Dr. Hazel Johnson Brown and another name in nursing policy, Mary Wakefield, she was there and a real role model. And I think that's the key is being helpful to one another. And so to your listening audience, whether you're a woman in business, a woman in telecommunication or whatever program you might be in, or maybe nursing, is bringing one another along, you know, women supporting each other, really important. And so Sharon Pierce, great example with the Yale School, Canada C School. Also part of bringing folks along, what I want you to do is also bring along and integrate your programs and your students. I have a great example. I have my doctoral student, Ron Costato, PhD program, nurse anesthetist, is currently the board of nursing president now in Delaware, who I mentored. He changed law in Delaware. His dissertation, so simultaneously while under me, studying advanced practice, registered nurse, independent practice. So during his three years of his dissertation, I crafted legislation based on his findings. So integrating what research has, and that's what we're about. So if you have research, which our students do, on health outcomes, on diabetes, on workplace safety, taking the nursing data and tying it in. So to your listeners who are in the business side, who are into healthcare or fitness or transportation, find out what nurses in your area, your universities, what studies are they doing? What's happening at that hospital? What clinical studies? I guarantee you there are things that nurses are doing. And so the Yale Candidacy School teaches nurses how you work at the bedside and how you take that information and run with it, whether you run for office, whether you get behind a candidate running, or whether you support, but there's a way to link it all together. It's so easy, right? It's really easy. You know, from the standpoint of serving in elected office, how has it changed or improved your nursing innovation chops? We often go the other way around where we ask, you know, how is nursing improved? But how has serving in an elected role improved you as a nurse innovator? Oh my gosh, being elected has really improved um, who I am as a professor and a nurse. I have seen up front and close how the issues in healthcare are so much more broad than being in my singular blinders on of nursing in a hospital or public health or prison or school. It has provided me the opportunity for all the systems. I recognize why transportation, I recognize why infrastructure is so important, having funds for uh, healthy, clean, good water and agriculture. It has exposed me to a lot of different venues and it has made me realize that nurses need to be at policy making decision levels because if not, someone else is going to make those decisions for you. Someone else will have the resources. Also our licensure. I didn't talk a lot about that, but the state licensure, making sure that advanced practice nurses can really function at the highest level of their scope of their practice, that they are able because we can both as nurse midwives, uh, clinical nurse specialists, nurse anesthetists, family nurse practitioners. We we can provide and we do provide most of the frontline health care in this country and we need to be respected and we need to have our insurance and our reimbursement just the same as other providers. It has shown me that without our voice being present that often we are not there and so as a person being in public policy has helped. It's been a challenge sometimes for my husband and my son. I've missed a lot of events. There are sacrifices that have to be made. Probably ages you a few days particularly if you're like me balancing you know mom and career and being in public There's a lot of sleep you're missing out on. Yeah, but it's rewarding. It's really rewarding. And I wouldn't change a thing. Bethany Hall Long, the undercover lieutenant governor, serves the citizens of Delaware as a public health nurse, 
professor of nursing at the University of Delaware and as their lieutenant governor. It was fitting to catch up with her. With the help of her great team, Laura Wisniewski and Keith Warren, just as she was sending Delaware firefighters across the country as part of a coordinated disaster response, epitomizing what nurses do. They rush to aid, they get in harm's way, and because they are so close to the problems, they can see causal factors in ways that others just can't. This helps them advocate for solutions and policies that improve safety, prevent a crisis, and build capacity to respond when necessary. Bethany and nurses serving in legislatures across the world make clear that fundamental nursing skills like listening, problem solving, managing resources, and innovating translate well into politics. Bethany runs a successful campaign for more nurses to run for office and engage in the political process. It's courageous, democratic, and innovative. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and share with a friend because that is what friends do. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance healthcare for all. Subscribe to the podcast and learn more at seeyounowpodcast.com.